Looking to earn PDH credits for watching this webinar? Please log in to SFP's eLearning platform and select this webinar. Earning PDH credits for this webinar on this platform are free for SFP members, but non-members will be charged. If you're just looking to listen or share information on fire protection engineering, feel free to continue with videos here. I'd like to thank uh, SFP uh, for this nice uh, invitation and uh, give me the opportunity uh, to present uh, some of our work, uh, especially it is the work that FM Global has been uh, focused on the last 10 years as a big long-term uh, strategic uh, 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 research work and from a, a big group of uh, scientists. And uh, some of the material, most of the material actually is published in uh, Fire Protection Engineering Magazine, uh, especially from the engineering application side. And uh, some of the details is published in uh, various uh, different scientific papers. So, um, so I hope uh, um, you know today I would uh, uh, present the material and uh, it's easier for uh, them, uh, you know, to reading the papers. Okay, uh, the topic. Uh, uh, a the development of CFD fire suppression model for industrial application. So one of the keyword here is a uh, fire model, but it's uh, on the suppression side. And um, for and also uh, for FM Global, uh, you can understand that typically it's industrial uh, protection application. Okay. In this uh, talk, I'm going to cover um, both the development side of the code. So you know a little bit about how the sausage is made, and also I'll uh, uh, also uh, focus on some of the application. Okay. Um, basically, when, when we talk about uh, the modeling, uh, they usually have a different perspective, as mentioned and uh, indicated in the title of the presentation. There's the both development side, and also there's application side uh, of the fire model. So. Uh, sometimes um, th the different side have a different perspective. It may or may not be aligned. So there's sometimes there's a gap in the, uh, in the leading to the misuse of the code and misunderstanding. Um, so uh, fortunately, at Tefan Global, uh, myself and my colleague uh, had the opportunity to wear both hats uh, as a developer. And in the meantime, we are using our own code to uh, for problem solving. Uh, an engineering application. So we had an opportunity to look from both sides, so that's why I want to uh, present uh, the, the model, uh, hopefully, uh, and also the application, hopefully, for the practical uh, fire protection engineering, they could understand uh, the prospect from a developer side. Okay, uh, before we really go into all the details of our modeling, we could review uh, the tools we have in hand as uh, fire protection engineers. Uh, uh, we have a typically hand calculation tools, which is uh, uh, usually uh, based on the correlation and implement in Excel or just uh, algebraic uh, equations uh, to look at uh, the interim and uh, fire, fire uh, Flame height, uh, smoke uh, temperature, ceiling jet, velocity, you know, things like that. And also, uh, we have zone model at hand, especially uh, for a regular size room. Um, uh, you can do at the smoke layer height and some of the uh, convective uh, venting velocity and temperature inside the room, since in that nature. Um, however, both hand calculation and zone model uh, with certain limitation uh, when it's coming to a more complex problem, usually uh, when the building geometry is different from the correlation or the zone, the model, the regular room size or the geometry. If the geometry is different uh, or the application of those simple model uh, will lead to a wrong result. And CFT model, uh, uh, actually divide uh, the field into smaller computational cells and solving the conservation equations uh, in, uh, uh, in in a field. So, 
So basically, the resolution is higher. Uh, the assumption being made is uh, uh, is less and more general, and uh, usually lead to a better result um, if it's used properly. So the safety model has been made very popular in fire field, uh, especially by the contribution uh, of FDS. Uh, so it's very popular. A lot of engineers have been using, uh, but it, there are other software has been uh, in place um, in earlier time, and also uh, uh, some commercial software uh, are also being used. Uh, another code uh, actually has been uh, developed by FM Global. It's called Firefoam. is part of a CFD code. Um, basically, the CFD model is a modern tool that we have uh, at Engineer, and uh, it is uh, the topic of this presentation. Um, we actually mentioned the three uh, uh, different kind of uh, modeling tool different depend on the capability. Um, and also from the perspective of problem solving, there are actually three different levels of my modeling tool. Um, the first level of the modeling we call to model the consequence of a fire. Uh, basically, for this application, usually the fire, fire side is prescribed. Usually, it's a T-square fire or a constant h release rate fire. And we use it as a design fire and to looking at the smoke transport and, and detection time, egress. Um, all these aspects are typically for life safety design. Okay, for this application, um, they could look at hey, what kind of a model is really required for us to accurately to uh, uh, to capture the physics. The main physics they are modeling is buoyancy driven turbulent flow, the, the, the flow transport of a combustion product, uh, basically hot gas. Um, um, this is usually well captured by the modern turbulent flow uh, technique called large eddy simulation. Uh, the essence of this technique is you use computational cell to capture the large flow structure, uh, the, the, the bond eddy, the plume, uh, the physical geometry, and uh, using the subgrid scale model um, to uh, to reflect uh, uh, to uh, you know subgrid scale physics is not resolved directly, but is being captured by the subgrid scale model. That's why we call large eddy simulation. Uh, there's relatively low requirement for other physics. For example, the combustion model don't have to be very sophisticated. Uh, it basically, you just need to provide the total energy release at a heat source. So we know how much um, thermal energy is being pumped into the system. And then we can look at the smoke transport. And the heat transfer is usually less critical. Uh, exactly what's a heat flux to the wall and radiation heat transfer are not critical part of the whole smoke transport simulation. Okay, in the second level of modeling fire, it actually model fire growth. We actually realize the most important consequence of a fire is its own growth. So as it is a scenario, the fire is not prescribed. It actually has to be predicted. So you have a flame, you need to figure out what's the heat feedback this flame going back to the fuel surface. And coupled with uh, the heat transfer within the fuel and the chemistry of the fuel. You can know how much combustible gas product being released and uh, determine how far, how big the fire will grow. To model uh, this uh, phenomena, we need definitely more physics. So just by assuming we are modeling a uh, flame spread along a corrugated cardboard surface. So we have a flame near the wall we need to figure out the convective and radiative heat flux back to the surface. And to do it well, we probably need to know how much soot the flame generated so that we know what's a radiant fraction. And also the combustion near the wall is critical because the flame height where the high temperature zone is uh, need to be well captured. And also the exact heat flux 
uh, back to the wall convection is uh, need to be very accurate. Especially that's the physics is very difficult to resolve with typical grid size. We need much finer grid near the wall. In the solid side, um, we need to do a heat transfer. And also we need to know the kinetics of some material to be able to understand how uh, fast the pyrosis process and how big the flame will be. So the whole system is coupled in a loop and is independent to each other. So the, uh, the physics is much more complex. The third level, we are moving not only to model fire, but also to model the suppression process. Here we have a water involved. Immediately we have a multi-phase flow in addition to the flame. Okay, the spray will have interaction with the fire plume and also the water will transport dripping flow down through the, uh, the fuel surfaces. And also the water will interact with the flame and to do its job of suppression. Okay, to model, we need to capture, for example, specific spray characteristic from a sprinkler spray or water mist spray. And again, it's transportation um, um, through the fire, the evaporation, the drag um, are all important. And then we need to know how much water will reach the fuel surface. And after that, what is the interaction with the flame? Okay, now the whole purpose of this development of the fire model is to move from the model simple smoke transport to model something like that. A warehouse flame with sprinkler suppression. Okay, here you have a, all different kind of fuels possible and different of configuration um, geometry and height and ceiling clearance and even sprinkler type pressure all change the dynamics. Some of, the, some, some of them need to be captured by the, uh, the, the CFT uh, mesh side. And some of them have to be implementing into the code as a mathematical form. And some of the input parameter need to be uh, extracted, uh, extracted from the experiment okay, to make this kind of simulation success. This again, this is a whole collection of additional physics that we needed for fire growth and suppression. Okay, I'm not going to repeat every single of them, but all of this model need uh, interaction to each other too, to making the, uh, the physics much more uh, complex. Beyond the more physics, there's another issue in the scale. In the industrial fire suppression, uh, usually we are talking about uh, tens of meters, you know, and, and you know, uh, 50 feet uh, warehouse and with high storage. So the size of a uh, uh, computational domain will be big. On the other end, the small scale physics and geometry and, and is, is also very small in a millimeter or uh, level. For example, the heat transfers near the wall the droplet, uh, the some of the detailed uh, geometry of the rack, and uh, all need a much smaller resolution. So there's a, a big scale separation from the large scale to a small scale that you need to model. Okay, and um, so the larger the scale separation, the larger the grid, uh, the total mesh size uh, is needed, and the computational cost will be. Okay. And I want to emphasize every model is actually designed for a certain grid size. So which means um, the physics which is above the grid size will be captured by um, the CFD calculation. And the physics um, which is smaller than the grid size has to be modeled, not resolved in the first principle. The model is subgrid scale model. So if you develop a model, for example, uh, with 
a design of a grid is one centimeter. If you're using that same model to solve a problem that you only have a grid of 10 centimeter side, and you are not expect to have an accurate result. Sometimes the result could be totally wrong and, and potentially could be even worse than the hand calculation. Okay, we see that's, that's how it works. And just because we need to resolve a lot of physics and the scale, total scale is big, uh, the simulation is very expensive, the hardware requirement for the, this kind of fire suppression simulation for industry application, it's much beyond typical computational power from a, a powerful laptop or desktop. Usually we are using at least a cluster or cloud computing capability uh, and even a supercomputer in a national lab. Uh, at FM Global, we typically using um, in the order of a hundred CPU core to a thousand CPU core in our internal cluster. And in addition, we are using uh, um, Amazon Web Service uh, for as a computational resource. Okay. For software requirement, it's also a little bit more complex. Uh, first of all, the parallel computing is very important because the computational uh, complexity is big, um, and also the mesh capability uh, required. We need unstructured mesh. The unstructured mesh means uh, the mesh could be um, typically arbitrary shape. Uh, you don't have to be a Cartesian box, um, um, so uh, it can be refined uh, in in a specific zone with relative ease, so the code can handle that mesh. Uh, with all this requirement of the software, uh, we chose to develop um, the fire modeling code based on a software package called OpenFORM. It's OpenFORM is an open source uh, CFD toolbox. Um, it has a typical capability as a modern commercial code like a Fluent or uh, Stasi uh, plus plus. Um, you use instruction mesh, have a massive parallel computing capability. And another feature is written in objective-oriented programming uh, uh, feature that the code maintenance uh, and um, uh, by different developer is relatively easier. Okay, and also there are some numerical uh, uh, schemes. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but basically, this is a state-of-the-art uh, CFT package that we can uh, take advantage of their numerical development. We only need to work on the fire-related related some model on this platform. So, so here comes the fire foam. That's the name of the code. The foam because the uh, name of the foam coming from the open foam platform. Uh, fire foam is a solver. Um, and also coupled with some libraries, uh, each deal with a specific sub -physics. For example, gas phase combustion, sorry, uh, radiation, pyrolysis, uh, ray two phase flow, and surface water flow. Okay. And um, Fireform is also open source. Again, the design purpose for this code is to model not only uh, smoke transport, but also moving to fire growth and fire suppression. This is the equation we saw uh, in the gas phase. Uh, nothing special, basically mass conservation, momentum conservation, uh, energy conservation, and species conservation. There are some terms in this equation we have to you know, apply the subgrade scale modeling, especially the combustion, buoyancy, and, uh, and heat transfer, turbulent transfer part. In the solid phase, we also need to solve the heat transfer equation through the solid material. Okay. Um, this is just an example of, um, of one simple paralysis model. We assume the virgin material will be heated up and at a certain temperature, it's starting changing to char and release gas. Okay, um, the heat transfer is one dimensional and some other um, 
assumption are we assume the material homogeneous, there's no geometry change. Okay. The chemical reaction is one step kinetics. And also there are certain ways we extract uh, the properties. I just want to emphasize the pyrolysis part is actually very difficult because it's very specific to the fuel itself. If you change a different fuel, the fuel might uh, behave differently, might heat it up, the, they might melt, drip, they have a different geometry change, uh, different chemical process. So you might have to develop a different uh, pyrolysis model and there's a different way to attract uh, uh, properties. So that's very fuel specific. On the liquid phase, um, especially on the area where um, between the solid phase and the gas phase, the water flow on the surface of uh, a box, for example. We also um, develop, you know, uh, solve the conser equation, conservation equation of mass, momentum, and uh, enthalpy. But we make some assumption that the flow is two dimensional. So we, we solve a simpler equation. And um, you need to create a mesh. And also, you need to couple the liquid phase with uh, all the droplet phase. The droplet interaction with water splashing, impingement, and even the dripping. And also, there's a um, mass and energy conservation in change uh, from not only the gas phase, but also the solid phase. So there's a lot of boundary condition and interface to capture all the physics. So now we have a mesh for both solid phase, liquid phase, and the gas phase. So, and we can couple all these different regions and different equations through their boundary conditions so that the framework of model the whole suppression uh, can be implemented in the code. In addition to the Olario mesh zones, we also need to solve uh, the discrete phase. For example, the transport of droplet that need to be tracked in a Lagrangian way. Okay, they're drag and they're, again, the heat transfer and the evaporation process uh, need to be captured. On top of that, there's a radiation calculation. It's not only the spatial mesh dependent, it's also dependent on the direction and also the wavelength. So, so the whole, uh, this is a very complex mathematical uh, implementation of all the different physics. With all this, we actually putting the mathematical framework within Firefall to be able to capture a fire suppression phenomenon. And the next question is, how do we get in the model parameter, some of the input parameter? I just want to give an example how we get in, for example, the material property. That's assuming we are treating as a, a, a corrugated car box. We cut a piece of material, put in a sample holder, and put it into one of the bench scale um, testing apparatus. For this case, we use uh, FPA. Okay, we heat it up with a different heat flux and looking at a mass loss rate, surface temperature, and parameter like that at, at different heating conditions. And then we're using the pilot model we built for this specific material. We back figure what would be the model effective conductivity, capacity, and activation uh, energy. So using that parameter, we could reproduce the material behavior in terms of heating and uh, mass loss rate at a different uh, wide range of uh, heating condition, which is typical in a fire condition from 20 kilowatts uh, per meter square to about 100 kilowatt per meter square. And then we're using those properties to start to predict the flame spread and the material de degradation. Okay. The whole process is a scale up process. We're getting material property from a small scale and, and they're using the intermediate scale to do the validation, code verification, and even calibration. And then 
we free the code, we don't change anything, we don't change the model, we don't change the parameter, we start to predict uh, the flame spread at a different geometry, for example, the rack storage configuration with different height and width. And, and then we can look at the performance of the code to see if the code have a, a predictive capability. Okay. All sub-models need to be validated separately before it being validated into an integrated form. For example, we're first looking at the gas phase validation, the temperature, instrument, flame height, things like that. And then we look at the heat transfer developer, uh, uh, looking at the radiation model. Do we give us the right radiation fraction and heat flux, both in the radiation and in the convective part near the wall? And with all the separate effect validation, we look at a, a flame spread in a vertical parallel panels. And then used on a more integrated configuration in the rack storage. The whole process is, is a scale up process. And some of some model related to suppression is we need to get in the sprinkler atomization you know, uh, parameters, the model. For example, what would be the flux distribution from a certain sprinkler at a, a certain pressure? What would be the velocity and dotted size? All these parameters are important to determine the uh, penetration of the spray through the plume. Okay, the spray plume interaction part will be validated through a typical ADD experiment. And, uh, and also we need to validate in the film flow. You know, given the water flux, what would be the velocity of the flow going down? What would, the, what would be the fraction of the dry area versus the wet area, which is an important physics to need to be captured, be able to really model the full scale suppression. So, uh, that's the television, you know, you said it everywhere. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. That. Okay. With all these physics integrated together, one of the uh, integrated validation we are doing is a uh, class two rack storage configuration with certain sprinkler protection. In this example, we are looking at two different kind of sprinklers. One is a, a quick response sprinkler a K14 uh, ESFR with a relatively higher flow rate. Another is a K11 uh, upright sprinkler with a lower pressure, which is a standard response. Okay, the quick response ESFR a sprinkler is on the top of this animation. And uh, uh, the K11 ELO sprinkler is on the bottom of the animation. On the top column is the simulation. On the right hand side is the experiment. We're comparing the experiment against the simulation side by side. As you can see now at this time, the quick, a quick response uh, ESFR sprinkler already activated at around 45 seconds with pretty high flow rate and relatively small fire size, the sprinkler, one sprinkler knocked down uh, the fire pretty easily. The fire is actually only confined underneath the boxes. But with a standard response sprinkler, uh, the sprinkler properly activated about 30 seconds later. And at that time, fire is a little bit bigger already. And also because the relatively weaker plume, uh, spray, the spray was not very successful in penetrating the plume and wetting the, all the vertical uh, surfaces. So you can see there's some rivulets and some dry area. And eventually flame actually starts to develop underneath the box and overtaking the fire, dry up the box, start to spread, okay? Apparently, one sprinkler cannot control this fire, especially this sprinkler is a control mode sprinkler, so you don't expect a, 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 it's going to surprise fire. You can see after around one minute of struggling, there's a more sprinkler has been activated in both sprinkler, uh, uh, in both animation, uh, our modeling, and also experiment. Um, there's about five sprinkler active at different time and start to wetting all the um, side box 
so far it's getting controlled and eventually eventually flame size is getting smaller and smaller that's how the control mode sprinkler works basically you can see the fire model can reproduce what's uh, observed in the experiment okay and and also can provide a lot more information where in experiment is harder to measure for example the local temperature um the local heat flux you know flame spread uh, uh flame spread um, um process and here we basically showing the heat release to prediction of uh um, of two different uh, rack storage configuration one is three tier the other is five tier hot okay you can see the model predict heat release rate is solid curve and compare with uh, the the symbols which is experimental measurement of the heat release rate as a function of the time okay obviously higher tier five tier uh, rack storage have a higher heat release rate especially the slope uh, uh, is much higher um, and it's going to about 45 to 50 megawatts um, after about uh, four minutes. You actually can see the heat release rate have a, a different slope at different stage. So each slope change corresponding to the flame spread mode change. The first uh, stage before 60 seconds is the vertical flame spread and the second stage is the horizontal flame spread, which is underneath the box. And then all this flame um, going, uh, going, getting involved with all the vertical surfaces outside of the rack is a stage three, which is a vertical flame spread. And later on, the, uh, on stage four, the flame will uh, propagating horizontally from the central two columns of the box to the side columns. Okay. And you can see, uh, again, we're comparing on the right-hand side of the picture for modeling uh, versus a, a picture from experiment. Can you finish that one? Yeah. OK. I'm, uh... So we basically see the model can capture the flame spread uh, pretty well with all the, with the two uh, uh, flame height. Uh, no, with the two rack storage height. With this comparison, we are very confident that the model have a capability to do some prediction. So here we are doing a prediction of what would be the heat release rate for seven tier uh, rack storage, which is impossible to put to, to fit underneath a calorimeter. We cannot measure the heat release rate, but we can model it now. Here we also contrast our model result of a rack storage with or without a wood pallet. On the right hand side, you would have a wood pallet underneath uh, the, the rack storage box. Okay, and what happens with with, with this additional fuel? Uh, they are actually making the heat release rate uh, uh, slope lower. The heat, heat the the flame spread rate is actually slower than without uh, the wood pallet. Although at a later time the total heat release rate can be larger because of additional fuel. Uh, what happens is that these wood pallets actually preventing the flame reaching underneath of the side box is making the horizontal flame spread slower. That's basically the model can reproduce that and can explain the physics much easier in addition to provide a heat release rate and a heat rate, uh, history. Okay, as I mentioned before, for different fuel, we would probably need a different uh, paralysis model. For example, uh, at FM Global, we do a lot of uh, sprinkler testing with standard plastic uh, commodity. We also call cotton and expanded plastic. So basically, it's just corrugated power box. Within there, uh, we're putting uh, some uh, clear plastic cups. Okay, there's 125 cups inside the box. Let's see how we model this kind of commodity. We're putting a, a cup with a box, again, into the bench scale FPA apparatus. We heat it up with a vertical uh, lamp, providing certain uh, heat flux. Then we observe the physics, 
there's a certain time we get into ignition and initially the cardboard will burn and later time the plastic getting involved okay the fuel will be different and also the getting more smoky and more more sooty and uh, um, the, the more uh, the hotter radiation uh, fraction is high now you're getting the property you, you're getting the data uh, you're trying to uh, implementing the physics into the model here we're using the layered approach basically in the outside of the car box, we are using again the one dimensional paralysis. We're heating up 1D heat up carbon kinetics. But within the cups, we are treating each cup at a control volume. Okay. And we're using the data extracted from bench scale experiment uh, to calibrate our engineering model, which is the heat transfer and the paralysis of this control volume of one cup. I'm not going to go into detail of the parallel model, but basically just showing uh, the integrated uh, flame spread simulation compared with experiment. Again, um, the model result reproduce the heat release rate heat rate pretty well, and you can also see from the comparison from the snapshots both from modeling and experiment. Here, I want to show you a very specific fuel which we can find in our industry clients, which is a paper manufacturing facility where uh, our client store all the paper rolls, uh, very large paper rolls uh, on end vertically, one stack on top of each other. Okay. What happens is uh, um, due to the storage space limitation, the client is tend to manufacture tend to build a higher and higher warehouse. Some of the highest warehouse is already a more than 60 feet high and, and going to about 80 feet or 100 feet, especially in Europe. So this kind of configuration is already beyond the test capability. Nowadays, the highest uh, uh, testing facility have about a ceiling um, at a, around 60 feet. Okay. And also, they also change the storage configuration just because they move away from a uh, clamp truck to using some ceiling uh, operated um, vacuum or, 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 or clamp. Um, so they have to store the row with certain gaps. So that will change some of the fire dynamics and availability of oxygen also making uh, the configuration more hazard. How do we model that? Well, by the way, um, I just want to compare, show you this kind of configuration is very dangerous. Think about the flame from 5 megawatts to 20 megawatts. For our standard plastic uh, configuration, it will take about one minute. But for the raw paper, uh, for a similar height, will only take about five seconds. So there's a lot of magnitude difference in terms of fire growth rate. Um, we have to develop a parallel model. Again, we need to observe how the fuel burns. For this specific case, okay, it's not simple one dimensional uh, heat up and uh, uh, homogeneous uh, fuel. A paralysis. Basically, you can see from this video clearly uh, the paper will break and will get detached from the uh, roll, and suddenly it's they are not losing heat from the the paper beneath, so the paper will burn very fast. It's changing from a thermally thick configuration to a thermally thin configuration. It's easy to burn. Okay, this delamination process has to be. Uh, captured by the model. And in addition to that, you actually can see some two-dimensional uh, physics, not only the detachment and delamination, but also the peeling, the propagation uh, of the delaminated front and also accelerated the sur uh, surface flame spread along the detached flame, the detached uh, paper sheets. So again, that's another physics is important of, um, to capture in the model. Okay. We have to build both 1D 
delamination and to the peeling and the flame spread into the into the model and again mesh it the geometry using unstructured mesh because we cannot use in the cutting grade for these rows especially in, within the narrow gap okay and uh, we would model um, after we develop model we would do some validation at different scale two row high by the way each row is about uh, eight feet tall so two row high, three row high, four row high, to see how the performance of the model against the environment. You can see that change of the slope of the heat release rate grows as a function of a row height. And also the model captures the trend very well, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Okay. And after we do, okay, I'm gonna show you one of the validation tests uh, we did. On the left hand side is our experiment, on the right hand side is uh, the model. This is a 20, uh, 28 feet tall. It's putting under uh, 25 megawatt kilometer, so we can measure the heat release rate. Okay, you already see from the experiment, because the flame is blocked by the, uh, the, 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 the front rows, uh, you only can see flame height from the reflection from side rows. In the modeling, we're actually making the front row transparent, so you actually can see how flame getting involved and spread uh, on the interior of, of the two rows. Okay, basically, uh, flame is getting trapped with between the two rows and getting the radiation uh, feedback from each other, and the, the oxygen can come through the open array, the flow space, um, and uh, suddenly um, the flame getting propagating very fast because uh, it starts to delaminating and spreading to the side row uh, very quickly too. Uh, again, as uh, the height of the, uh, the paper row increasing, the hazard is getting increased uh, dramatically too. After val validating for our model can capture the flame spread for two rows, three row, and four row high. They actually do a prediction for um, for the flame spread uh, of six row high. Here we can only do uh, experiment with suppression because the free burn testing will be too dangerous. And also, it's impossible to measure heat release rate for this flame. So we can only rely on the model result. Uh, on the right hand side, you know, we have to you know, dump a lot of water to put it out. And, and on the left-hand side, we're basically showing if there's no water, the heat release rate uh, increasing will be on the order of five megawatts per minute, per second. Okay, so you, if you design a suppression, you have to make sure the water um, sprinkler getting activated before, before uh, you, the vertical flame spread getting to the high slope. We're basically using the model to design our, our guide uh, for protection design and also doing experiment to validate in some of the model result uh, on the suppression side. And eventually using the model to predict uh, the protection that we cannot do the test directly. Okay, this is how it works. Uh, we do the expression, uh, suppression modeling for 14 feet under 16 feet ceiling and we do it for 28 feet storage under 16 feet ceiling, 42 uh, feet of storage under 16 foot ceiling. We have a suppression experiment. We compare the model result and using the model to predict the 60 feet, 62 feet of storage under 80 feet of ceiling. Okay, this model has been mature enough. We actually trust the model enough. Uh, we're using uh, the, the model result uh, to design the protection, and the protection is actually into um, the updated uh, FM data sheets. Now, this is a simulation of uh, one of our sprinkler uh, protection. Um, I believe that's uh, 42 feet, no, 62 feet under 80 feet C. You can see. Um, we basically activated a sprinkler uh, about 
seven sprinkler right above the array in early time to uh, surprise for us. Okay, there are some other applications. Um, we use a model to, uh, hold on. I should have an animation here. Okay, somehow it's not working. Um, anyway, we're also using a model to help us design the UX sprinkler design. Okay, for different commodity, we're using our uh, the film model to model the water transport transport of for all the different the commodity. Okay, looking at the transport time, and also we coupled the modeling result with some smaller scale, inter -scale intermediate scale testing for different um, uh, for, 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 for different fields to determine what would be the critical water flux required uh, uh, to have a successful protection of that spe specific zones for the EREC. Okay. Then we're using the model to change different parameters, for example, flow rate, pressure, the location of the sprinkler head, and, uh, and also different separation distance um, of the, of, of, um, the EREC sprinkler um, to determine at what scenario we would get in the water which is above the critical water flux needed. And then using the model to guide uh, the protection design and being validated in large scale testing. Okay, for a scenario like this, um, without modeling, we probably at least need three to five testing to come up to getting a successful, successful uh, protection point. Um, but with the modeling, we were able to achieve much more optimal protection, okay, with about 25 feet to 30 feet separation distance um, with only one test, okay. It's basically much better way to solve the problem and we can provide much more opt optimal solution and be validated. Uh, another application of this model we did recently was working with um, an FPA um, for research uh, foundation uh, to work on the sprinkler activation on a slope to ceiling and also objective ceiling. Basically, you have a slope and you have purling and girders to see how that uh, construction feature will change in your sprinkler activation pattern and, and time. Okay. Some of the ongoing development, um, basically, again, we need to develop a um, specific paralysis model for different fuels, okay? Uh, we are tackling different um, uh, uh, fuels. Uh, for example, we are working on a UUP uh, commodity, and also we're looking at the suppression of those complex fuels. But in addition to the sprinkler protection, we also look at the water mist protection. Okay, a little bit different from sprinkler in water mist uh, protection, um, to be able to model that accurately, the gas phase extinction is much more important. Okay, for sprinkler cases, um, the, the suppression happens in, uh, uh, in the liquid phase, basically the water interaction on the fuel surface. However, in the water mist, uh, the extinction a lot of happens in the gas phase. So we need to work on a more advanced combustion model and also the radiation attenuation by the droplets and um, it's much more important in the water mist than sprinkler. So some of the new capability we are developing. And also we are modeling, um, we call VOF modeling, volume of fluent modeling of uh, initial sprinkler spray. Uh, basically we are showing the video it uh, simplified sprinkler geometry, uh, basically a jet hitting on the, on the disk, what kind of spray characteristic will be developed, we can model from first principle and compare with experimental laser measurement of the flux distribution and velocity and droplet size, and eventually using that parameters as the input of fire suppression model. Okay. Basically, this is pretty much what I want to show um, some of the key t 
takeaways and summaries. Um, in the last 10 years, we start working on a new platform called Firefoam the, the, with the objective to model industrial fire protection, uh, which is much more complex than the smoke transport. Therefore, it requires a lot more subphysics, uh, mathematical frame form, uh, you know, frame, frame, uh, mathematics. Some models need to be implemented into a CFD framework. They need to have a better mesh capability and, uh, and certain compu computational power all required to solving this more challenging problem. We made some progress. A lot of verification, separate effect verification and validation has been conducted by the developers with different scenario. And especially the validation has been conducted with different scales. Remember scale up, we do a validation for one tier high, two tier high, three tier high, then we can do the prediction for five tier high, seven tier high. And within this process of model development and uh, validation, there's a lot of input from experimental side. It's actually very critical. Without experimental support, there's no way we actually can develop a physical based model and be confident about it. For example, we rely on experiments to show us the key physics. For example, I showed you the physics in the pyrosis part of a paper roll, how it burns. Okay, and rely on the experiment to give us the model physics. And also the input, we need to measure the property of the uh, material. We need to measure the characteristic of sprays. Uh, those input are so critical. And also we need experiment to provide validation data. Without validation data, we would not know if all this complex physics coupled together, are uh, they capture the right physics? Are we having enough resolution to be accurate? Are we confident on our experiment, on our modern result? So this validation result, um, integrated scale, large scale is very important. Another thing I want to emphasize, the verification and the validation also need to be done at the user level. Usually you cannot rely on the, the developer has done certain Validation exercise for similar scenarios, so I can use it. There's a two two ways could make it, you know, the simulation wrong. Once, you know, the application scenario could be slightly different from the model development. So, for example, again showed the different physics in different fields. Okay, and also if you validate it against sprinkler. The same model um, may or may not working for water mist just because some of the assumption made in uh, uh, approximation in a model, um, which will make the model only working reasonably well for sprinkler. But when you have a much smaller droplet size, some other physics might be important. You have to uh, include in that physics. Okay, and also another source of error is basically just input. You know, um, for one person to do a validation, it may not necessarily means another user will have a right mesh, right input parameter, right configuration of the model. So you have to show at the user level, so your model result is um, valid. So certain validation is always needed. Um, so basically still, the model has certain predictive capability, but a lot of times the model need to be used along with experiment to supplement the experiment and not really to replace the experiment. Usually without a good experiment, um, model may or may not uh, be uh, well grounded in terms of physics and accuracy. Okay. Um, I just wanna mention this is work from a huge team team, not only CFD developers, and also a lot of people from experimental side too, both from small scale lab scale experiment and from large scale testing. Okay, um, I just want to thank you, uh, thank all my uh, colleagues who contribute a lot uh, to this work. And with that, 
um, at the end of the presentation, I could uh, um, welcome some questions. 